Craig Blair. Craig, good morning to you. Good morning. Sounds like you got a good crew in there working with you today. Oh, I try to get the best in here. I pay the best money, so it's not surprising I get the best people. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm certain they're all going to the bank afterwards and cashing those checks. <laughs> as fast as possible. As fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Direct deposit, baby. Direct deposit. Uh, Craig, uh, if I just might as well get you to chip in on it, too, because Form Energy has been a big part of our discussion over the last uh, – uh, half a week here or so on the program, and uh, John addressed it. Uh, Mitch had a, a discussion about it yesterday with us, too, and uh, maybe get your take on it one more time because it's been brought up as an issue by uh, your opponent in the upcoming uh, Republican primary for your Senate seat, and uh, that was criticism of the form energy deal, that it was not a good deal and a better deal could have been had. Well, it's pretty hard to make a decision on whether it's a good deal or not when you're on the outside looking in. Uh, but the, the, the bottom line is is that corporate America, um, the board of directors of all want carbon neutral footprints, whether it's Nucor, Procter & Gamble, Clorox, commercial metals, the list goes on and on. And if we want to be able to attract the jobs to the state of West Virginia, you got to be able to play along when it comes to that. Now, the way you set the contract up is, is that they're going to create 800 million, or excuse me, 800 jobs, of, and it's all triggered in. The way that contract was set up is, is that they don't meet those goals, they don't get the money. Okay, and I was, you know, I had some hesitancy about it, but as more went along, and I actually made recommendations to the contract, and they delivered upon those, so that it felt like that it was a safer of uh, opportunity for the state of West Virginia to, for to be an all the above energy state, and when you do that, then it makes it so they're way more attractive to business, and I, I can actually prove that for that matter. That's so I'm going to segue you over to our totals, and we've still got nine days left to go in this month, uh, but we're exceeding our corporate net income tax collections by $52 million just for the month of September. That means that people are working in the state of West Virginia, jobs are being created, and opportunity, upward mobility for the people in our state is taking place. Uh, when I want to jump over to the personal income tax, it's $100 million above the revenue estimates. And keep in mind that we're taking less off, 21.25% less off of people's paychecks right now on the, the collections of the state tax, of the personal income tax. So these are good things of, in a way. Now, I will have to be honest with you that I lost a $100 bet because I said there would be no coal-fired energy going into the, of form energy up there, and it's my understanding that they've already got a contract where you know coal-fired electricity is going to uh, be stored at that facility. They got a contract for that. I'm shocked. I didn't see that happening. I've seen renewables, whether it be wind or solar, of uh, that where they'd store that and be able to move it on and off the grid. And that's what this technology is about: is making it so that if you're going to use the green energy that's being produced out there. It needs to be done in a way that you can get it to market and maximize the profits on it. That form energy project will actually help do that, and it's helping revitalize the northern panhandle. Craig, let's talk about the challenge to your incumbency as the uh, Senate president and the Senate uh, elected Senate representative here uh, in the eastern panhandle out of the 15th. Uh, talk to me about uh, being challenged in this primary coming up again. Competition's a good thing. You can't be hypocritical and say that you need competition for education, that you need competition in what we do in the government. We need competition for the, you know, bidding contracts so that we can keep the prices lower and keep the results better. And so I welcome the competition of when it comes to this. I'm not going to say anything negative about either one of my opponents of from, from that standpoint because the bottom line is is that we've done a good job. 
we've done a really good job uh, for, from that matter, whether it is the state's finances or, uh, you know, the largest ta- tax cut in state history. We banned elective abortions, you know, strong Second Amendment protections, some of the best in the country, campus carry, constitutional carry. You know, we've created thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs, the most comprehensive school choice policy in the nation. Come on. Religious freedom. Uh, We took care of that this year. Critical race theory has been addressed in this state. We have really, really, really taken it uh, to to the the low-hanging fruit's not there anymore. And so what we're right here doing is looking at how we can make government better. And one of the things the Senate president and uh, I get these agencies, and I send a directive out at the end of August to everybody that if you see things that we need to be doing to make it so that you can do your job better, more cost-effective, and get a better end result to the consumer, we need to know about it. We need to know by, by October the 1st. You do not show up in January and decide what your agenda is going to be and how to be able to make the state of West Virginia better. That's a 365-day-a-year process, and but when it comes to this uh, regular session in January, you need to be getting these bills together, you need to be able to get our members together in a caucus and have discussions about it, and then be able to get these bills drafted up and get them across the finish line, not just in the Senate, but in the House, with the approval of the government. And that's one of the things that I'm actually good at, is getting all the players together and working to solve the problems of uh, in West Virginia. You don't look at the hood ornament and drive down the road. What you need to do is know what your destination is going to be. And our destination is not the middle of the pack for the people of West Virginia compared to other states. It is going to be one of the best states in the union. Let me add one more thing on that. I was in Chicago for a conference here a couple weeks ago, and there were representatives from states from all over the country. And I was right in the middle of it. And they went down through, and they were a lot of them were complaining about what was going on in their state and what they needed to do and all that. And I got, when it came my turn, I started talking about all the great things that was happening in West Virginia. And it's not just in the other parts of West Virginia. It's happening in the eastern panhandle. And I, I laid all that out, and the speaker that went after me was from Oregon. She goes, her first words out of her mouth was, I want to move to West Virginia. That is the change that you're seeing in the state of West Virginia that is being recognized by the rest of the country and in some areas of the world, whether it be Turkey, whether it be Taiwan, whether it be Israel. Matt Harvey. Um, Senator Blair, as you're I'm sure you've already heard that about this new Freedom Caucus, and it includes members of the Senate. Yes, he's heard. Yes, yes. If you want I, me to answer I, that, I thought you guys had a question. No, well, that, that I was wanting your thoughts on that, and and it, if that's uh, how that how you see that playing out on legislation. I, I, I actually, I don't pay too much attention to it, and the reason for it is is that uh, every morning of seven o'clock in the morning. All the members of the West Virginia Senate that are Republican, you can't caucus the Democrats, and there's only three of them, we sit down together, and we determine what our agenda is going to be. We have discussions about it, and if, for instance, somebody comes up with an idea to improve something, uh, then we may lay that bill over a day or two, and then we get to work on improving it. Everybody in the caucus is uh, participatory on that, and my job is, is to facilitate facilitate the will of those members. And so, you know, the Freedom Caucus, I think more than anything, that that's got to do more with wanting to push their agenda. Keep in mind, there's only seven of them in, uh, from the Senate. I don't even know who they are. I know Robert Carnes is likely one of them, and Patricia is one, uh, because she's the vice chair of the caucus. Uh, But the fact of the matter is, if they've got good ideas and they want to bring them forward, please 
let's do so and, and, and do that. But, the, you know, they're not going to make a whole lot of decisions when they, there's only seven of them. But maybe they can actually come up with some good ideas. But we're always open to how we can actually move the state of West Virginia forward and, and improve things. Now, if this is going to be a thing for Robert Carnes to be disruptive like he is, uh, and I get a big kick out of that. He made a big deal out of day 59 uh, because we weren't reading bills that had already been read six times, three in the House and three in the Senate. And then you get to the special session. And, you know, we had to suspend the rules in the special session. He voted over 50 times to suspend the rules in the special session. So, you know, you can't have it both ways. It was about being disruptive, and that's why he got removed for, for one day. And and that was with the will the members wanted it done. In fact, the members wanted to remove him from the Senate in general, and I said no. Uh, from that standpoint, there's a better way of going back doing this, and we did. And, it, and all you had to do was look to Nashville and Tennessee a couple months later, Actually, it was a couple of weeks later where they threw somebody out. But that Freedom Caucus, not a problem. Uh, again, we are working for the people of West Virginia. And as I just got done reading off, there's so many very, very conservative things that have been addressed. And we want to be able to keep moving the state of West Virginia forward. John Gilstrap. Uh, good morning, Senator. Is there a concern, um, was it 2016, I think, is, is when things switched from Democrat to Republican in, in the... 2015. 2015. And uh, so here we are, supermajority in, in both houses. And there seems, from the outside, of course, the people who, who get the news are the ones who make the, the, the loudest noise. It seems that there's a pull within the party to go farther and farther to the right, into the... Um, well, reasonableness is in the eye of the beholder, I guess. But in into the real hardcore social issues and that sort of thing, and abandoning or or turning away from some of the more practical elements of leading from the right. Do you sense that? Is there a pull toward the far right? There's a pull for uh, some members to do that, and you got to keep in mind that I lean very much so to the far right of uh, on doing things. Uh, but you got to be pragmatic and understand that un- that you can do things incrementally. I learned that in workers' comp uh, back in 2003 when I first was elected. I wanted workers' comp fixed right then and there. And if we would have done it, we would have bankrupt the state of West Virginia, and it would have failed. So we actually had to incrementally be able to manage that aspect of it. But there are some things that we have moved at the speed of light. The abortion issue is a prime example of that, uh, to where the U.S. Supreme Court made a ruling on it, and it was in a little bit of no time that we were in a special session addressing it. And we did what the people of West Virginia wanted us to do. Now, we might not have done what we, uh, that a few members wanted to do, where they wanted to have zero exceptions. But the proof's in the pudding. There was over 400 abortions taking place in the state of West Virginia, and it's down to four. And I have no idea whether they're a topic pregnancy or whether it was to save the life of the mother. But I can tell you right now that to saving 396 lives uh, over the last year, that's a victory. That's a huge victory. And and if things want to gravitate uh, further uh, to, to where there may be no exceptions or whatever, and the votes are there, I'm here to go along with doing that. But at that given point in time, those votes aren't there. And to be honest with you, I'm a pretty good vote counter. Okay, my whip doesn't come, go out and do a lot of vote counting for me. I could do the vote counts at seven o'clock in the morning when we're there from seven to eight thirty each morning discussing things, and it doesn't take me long to be able to calculate up where the votes are to get things done, and that's where we work together. Now, you know what my biggest concern on this is is throwing each other under, under the bus because we all represent each other, uh, different areas of the state, and you know. 
you might not have a Republican getting elected in Kanawha County with the same issues that you could from Tucker County or Morgan County. And so you got to be able to understand, to be a little bit pragmatic about it and work your way through to getting things done because coming in and saying it's got to be my way or the highway yields zero results almost always. Yeah, Craig, and uh, this is John. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on about the, you know, speaking about the factions uh, that end up happening in the party. And those factions have always been there. This is the Freedom Caucus is just another, the newest faction that's kind of came out. When the Democrats were in control, there was factions of pro-business and the Union Democrats, uh, the moderates, the socials. I mean, even the, the Western Democratic Party now has moved really far to the left. Um, when I first got to Charleston, um, there was a faction within the Republican Party. We, we were only 57 and you had the union republicans versus the non-union republic so these factions have always caucus yeah in the caucus these factions have always been there within the caucus so so i mean and and they'll they'll always be there um but from the house side we what the senate does we caucus every morning at eight o'clock and anyone can bring up any issue they want to bring up and we go through every bill that's going to be in either committee or if it's going to be on the house floor we go through every piece of legislation and that's people's time to speak up Yes, and I helped encourage that uh, because of the fact that we've been doing this since 2015 uh, of going over it. And, and, and again, the, the factions are there, and we've only got three Democrats uh, in the West Virginia Senate. So, you know, it, it, it makes it so that it's difficult for them to mount any opposition uh, to, to things. But I'm telling you right now, even when they've got a good idea on solving a problem to make it better, we incorporate it. Uh, uh, you shouldn't worry about whether the, uh, something that's going to move the state forward should be coming from uh, the Democrats, the Republicans, the moderates, the far rights, whatever you want to call it. It should, be, if it's a good idea, and you can garner the votes for it. And that is what I think I excel at in our caucus is being able to do just that, make it so that you are heard uh, on what's going on, and that you are participatory. And I, and I look at it as we're the board of directors. Uh, for, on the Senate side, we're a board of directors and that we're having long-term visions for the, the state of West Virginia. So not concerned about it. In fact, I'm sort of tickled about it. Senate President Craig Blair, our guest here on the program. Craig, two issues are going to be brought forth or have been already regarding you. One is you don't do enough for the 15th specifically, and another is you pay yourself too much money. Your response to both of those, because that's already become an issue now as you approach this primary coming up. Okay, first of all, I don't pay myself too much money. Uh, I work basically 50 weeks a year, uh, and then I do it both in the Eastern Panhandle and I do it at the Capitol. But I'm going to give you an example of why you need me at the Capitol. And uh, the other day, Steve Cat. Catlett called, and we're talking about an issue that's going on in Berkeley County. Steve's the county commissioner, and I was able to put him on the speakerphone because Brian Abraham was standing right next next to me, the governor's chief of staff, and we were able to determine a path forward right then and there. And you have to have somebody there that are fighting the issues of and, and, and managing the issues so that things move at the speed of business, not the speed of government. And for far too long, that's been the way it's been there. Now, I make about $65,000 a year, and uh, the, the Senate president gets paid more during the session. Uh, it's, I think, $150 a day more during the session uh, than what everybody else does uh, on that, but it's because I, I'm on the phone all the time. I've been on the phone since 7 o'clock this morning, uh, but the pay issue of uh, is irrelevant. They filed ethics complaints against me. I am quite confident that there is nothing going to be found on that because I'm not doing anything wrong. The other part of that is when they're calculating those funds up is is that I have to travel 300 miles. And the very people that are complaining about that also get travel from their home to Charleston, no matter how close. Well, it's not. That's not exactly true. I think it's 35 miles away. You commute, uh, but the rest of us, you know, because I am 300 miles away, 
uh, from that standpoint. So, and what was the other question? I've forgotten it. Specific to the 15th district, you know, some of the accomplishments uh, you mentioned, of course, benefit everybody in the state, including residents of the 15th. But what about doing things specifically for residents of the 15th? Uh, done a lot of things specifically for the residents of the 15th and, and the Eastern Panhandle. And I, I say I represent the Eastern Panhandle, not just the, excuse me, the 15th district. Uh, the, the, recently, 25 million and another 25 million was put uh, brought back to the area. It's about two hundred million dollars that has been coming back in uh, since I've been representing in the majority party back to the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, there's going to be new rest areas. Uh, of I'm working on a plan of uh, to be able to address Route Nine. These are things that just don't happen instantly. Of uh, but we get a lot of money back into the Eastern Panhandle. But you know what? The history has been, whoever the Senate president was or the finance chair was, they sent all the money to their districts and to hell with the rest of the state. Uh, the rest of the state would give anything to have the opportunity and the growth that we have in the Eastern Panhandle. Now, what we have to do is lift up the rest of the state. And when we lift up the rest of the state, it makes it so that there's more resources in the Eastern Panhandle. We're able to keep more of our own. But I am not the type of guy that goes out there and pounds my chest and gets my picture taken saying, look, I brought this back. I brought that back. There was money brought back for the air show the other day. I didn't get my picture taken. You weren't seen involved in it. But I helped coordinate a lot of that behind the scenes. And there's a reason for it. Number one is my parents brought me up better than that. But the second reason is is that you brag about how much money that you're bringing back and taking credit for it. Then you got a line of people everywhere else that is wanting money for this and that. And lots of times it doesn't have a return on investment. When you put money back into the Eastern Panhandle, every time there's a return on that investment, and it pays dividends, not just for the people of the Eastern Panhandle, but for the state of West Virginia. And on that note, Craig, I thank you very much for your time this morning and wish you a great day, sir. Oh, it's wonderful. I thank you for having me on. I'll do it anytime. Senate President Craig Blair.